Hi everyone and welcome to another installment of Virtual Face to Face. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the robot revolution and how robotics, automation and AI are impacting the way, the way we live from jobs to our society in general. And uh, to talk about that, I am here with um, Prankit Gupta, who is a postgraduate researcher as the, at the Bristol Robotics Laboratory. Welcome. Well, thank you very much for having me. And, um, uh, yeah. Sorry, no, just before we start, I just wanted to mention that if anyone has any questions um, and uh, or anything to to yeah to ask um, throughout the course of this of this conversation, please please feel free to um, write anything you might have to to ask us, and we will ded be dedicating about a probably about fifteen minutes towards the end to all of your questions. Um, so yes, let's take a dive into uh, this conversation, which is. I mean, it's pretty huge. <laughs> uh, let's start off with we're talking about a little bit of, of specifically what what you do and and, and the Bristol um, Robotics Lab, and and uh, yeah, everything that it does and what you do in particular in, within it. Uh, sure. Um, so yeah, uh, Bristol Robotics Lab. It's a collaboration between the University of West of England and the University of Bristol. Uh, so my research is uh, specifically funded by the University of West of England, but we have academics and researchers from both universities working together on various different projects. So it's a sort of a big multidisciplinary community, and uh, we have you know various different sort of departments and research break breaking broken down into different themes. Mm -hmm. uh, my research specifically is in the assisted living department, and so we're looking at how we can develop technology. Uh, to support vulnerable people as well as you know solutions related to the healthcare industry uh, but if you go on the website bristolroboticslab.com you can see all the various different projects and you know, various different research themes if you click on assisted living you will see uh, my supervisor's name professor praminda caleb solly who is a great inspiration and um, you know love to be working with her and you can see all the different projects in the assisted living area as well and my work is uh, specific to people with learning disabilities. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at how we can develop technology in a way that can support uh, people with learning disabilities to live more independently in their own homes, as well as receive more responsive care. So we're also looking at how uh, we can support the sort of the care industry and have the sort of ecosystem of technology around it. Wow, I mean, I can imagine that being incredibly applicable at a time like this. When so many people who who might you know who need care maybe at home have you know the, the opportunities now to leave our houses are, are sort of minimal, especially during a lockdown period. So I can imagine just how advantageous something like this would be, mm -hmm. especially even going forward. Um, specifically with regards to you know we we think of we think of robots, we think of these. We have conjures up these dystopian images of, of you know the robots take versus man you know and and they're going to take over the world and all but you know we're talking there's, there's robotics there's ai and there's automation they're three different words that have different meanings um what 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 would you say you know what would you give us a sort of brief description of each um and and how how do they come together Sure, um, I think it's a great question. Uh, and really to start with, I'd say, you know, robotics and artificial intelligence, they're sort of very broad terms and there's very different definitions out there. But I think it's an interesting exercise to try and see like where that boundary lies mm -hmm. of things that sort of encompass what a robot is and what AI is. But I'll start with the simplest of the three, which is automation. And automation is simply the use of technology to automate tasks. And at a very basic level, an example would be, you know, if you open Microsoft Word on your computer, uh, there's this feature called autosave. And so when you're editing a document, it automatically saves what you're doing. Um, and that is basically an automation. Now, if I was to build a sort of some sort of motorized device that could sort of physically, you know, press the buttons on your computer and save that document, that's where you'd start veering into the robotics field. So when you have this sort of uh, mechanical or, or, or uh, sort of hardware that can interact with the environment, uh, that's when you start entering the field of robotics. And you could ask the question, for example, you know, is, is a washing machine a robot? And you could say it's a robot that washes your clothes. And essentially, you know, when you are pressing buttons on a washing machine, you're sort of programming it programming some sort of automation in it, and then you put your clothes in and you leave it and it just runs through the cycle um, and it washes your clothes. 
And again, you know, if you think about an ATM, uh, we call it an automatic teller machine. If I was to build a, a robot that sort of looked humanoid and you could sort of hand it a card, you know, your card, and it would look at your details, it would take cash out from, the, you know, under the counter and hand it to you and then enter your details on a computer, you would say that's a robotic banker. And that's very close to what an ATM already does. You know, you put your card, it pulls it in. So the point I'm trying to get at is terms like, I think, a robot is, is more of a spectrum. There's this point where machines, they start appearing to us like robots. And there's a point where robots start resembling machines. And this sort of this view that you have of robots, I think that can depend on your worldview and what your understanding of a robot is. Mm -hmm. And for the general public, as you mentioned, a lot of times, you know, when you hear the term robot, you sort of immediately imagine things that you've seen in a movie, you know, these humanoid looking things walking around. But in reality, you know, robots are very diverse and they're really good at doing very specific tasks they're designed for, which is again why I think washing machine is a good example because if you had five different tasks, it's, it's easier to design five separate robots for each one of those tasks than it is to have one robot do all of them. And again, you know, that's why you have a washing machine and you have a separate thing called a dishwasher because it's harder to have one machine do sort of do both the things. And it's very close to how we do things in robotics actually. And, you know, moving on to artificial intelligence. Now, you know, intelligence itself is a sort of very loosely defined term. So we can put that to the side for now. I'd say at a basic level, artificial intelligence is any type of sort of software or, or any type of device that appears intelligent to us. So it behaves in a way that when we look at it, it, it seems as if it's intelligent. And you know that basically is artificial intelligence. It's a big umbrella term, and there's you know from a technical point of view, there's lots of sort of things within artificial intelligence, like mm -hmm. machine learning and you know fuzzy logic and all these things. Uh, but essentially, you know, for, for for a layman, it's when anything appears like it's being intelligent, it's artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And just going back to that washing machine example, uh, if you know you didn't have any buttons on it and you just kind of put your clothes in there, and it would have sensors that would detect whether you have white, so mixed colored clothes and how soiled they are and you know how much detergent it needs and all those things, you could start to say there's some sort of artificial intelligence in there because it seems to be working in a way that appears intelligent, intelligent to us. Mm -hmm. So again, it's, it's, it's again a spectrum, you know, it's, it, right. it depends on your view. And when we're writing technical papers and uh, you know, scientific papers, we try to be very specific. So you know, when we're talking about robots, we'll say something like teleoperated robotic arm or when we're talking about you know AI, we would be very specific. It's you know supervised machine learning or this and that because the term you know AI by itself it's so broad it wouldn't really mean anything right. uh, unless we explain it. Explain yeah. Well, I I find it interesting um, how you use the example of you know the ATM and if there was the equivalent of that in sort of a humanoid form, um, it would be called like an automatic banker. But the, the, the interesting, the thing that I find kind of fascinating is that there's almost, it's, it's, it, we, as you said, we live with robots, basically. I mean, in a sense that yeah. the washing machine, the dishwasher, um, yeah. robot, we live with robotics. Um, and yeah. robotics and AI, like if you're using the phone, you know, exactly. you've got text prediction, autocorrect, and all of that is, you know, it falls within that umbrella term of exactly. AI. So we're already interacting with robots and AI every day. But when we think of AI, we imagine, you know, we immediately imagine some sort of futuristic sci-fi, you know, Skynet Terminator scenario. Well, that's, and that's, I think, that's yeah, yeah. Thinking it as a spectrum, I think it helps take away some of that, you know, elusiveness and it takes away some of that, like, fear of the unknown, because you kind yeah. of realize that, a robot is as simple as your washing machine in the sense it's doing a specific task you specific know it's not task. yeah well i mean uh, you know the the as a society we've gotten very much used to the washing machine the dishwasher these things that now are kind of seen as like the basics in any household and yeah um and there was a time when they weren't taken for granted there was a time when they were new the television as well it, there was a yeah. time when it was all new and there's always been resistance to the the new Although maybe in certain times there was more of a willingness to embrace it because yeah. you know, the dishwasher, the washing machine, I'm always using those same examples because I find them very, um, I find them really good examples of things that have made yeah. our lives clearly easier. Um, mm -hmm. And But going back to that, the, the example of, of giving something a humanoid form, specifically with regards to robotics, what, the, this, the, the, I think where people start to feel like, oh, okay, 
is, is when you start seeing something that's starting to look a little bit like a human and you're like, well, why? Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> there's this feeling that then it becomes a robot because it's somehow almost visually also looking like us and yeah. It might not do anything, but it kind of looks like it's about to take over. Yeah. Like it's going to be the next thing. It's going to take over yeah. what we can do as people. And in the same way, yeah. also with AI, you know, when things like I'm using the very basic, uh, you know, the versions of basic in the sense that what we all use of, um, you know, Alexa and Google, I and mean, you can talk to you talk to your machine and yeah. it does things for you, right? Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people think, you know at least at the beginning and even a lot of people now are very kind of reluctant because they're like where is this going you know and it's yeah. that's when it starts to seem more like it's doing things us humans can, can yeah. do and should be doing um what what is what do you think like psychologically that boundary between you know what we are willing to accept because in some way it doesn't sound like us doesn't look like us yeah and, yeah um, and, i think it's yeah. Yeah. It, well, again, I think it's a very good question. So with, you know, when, when we have robots that sort of look like humans, we call them humanoid robots, human, mm. uh, humanoid robots. But generally, the human form is very inefficient for robots, because when you're designing, like, imagine trying to design a washing machine that actually has hands and it's like physically, you know, moving your clothes around, you know, the amount of dexterity required and it's, it's just, you know, unimaginable. So it's easier to have a washing machine look like a washing machine. And I think when, when you have robots that sort of resemble humans, there's, so within the assisted living, again, we have something called a social robots and social mm -hmm. companions. And actually the image you have on the poster, uh, that's the pepper robot that we have in the lab. And again, the point here is, you know, the robot, it can't physically really carry things and do much, right. but it has this face and it can sort of emote with some lights and it has a really nice voice and it can do some gestures with its hands. So we call it like a companion robot, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the issue is when you have robots, so I think Pepper is a good good example of a humanoid robot, but you can have humanoid robots, I think, that do elicit a bit of fear. And there's this concept of the uncanny valley. So, I mean, you must have, you know, seen some like dolls that just, there's something about it that just, you know, scares you, even yeah. though they look like a, you know, look like a child and they look like a person. Yeah. And it's basically when you have something that looks like a person and behaves like a person, but not quiet, and you can't put your finger on it. And that's, I think that's that's what the, that concept of uncanny uh, valley is. Right. So when we're like, when roboticists are designing robots that look like humans for, you know, if it's for a purpose of like a social robot, um, there's, you know, there's this sort of drive to design it in a way. So you're not, you're not in that uncanny valley, you know, either there's some sort of differentiating factor. Now with Pepper, the example that you have in the poster, the reason it doesn't really look scary, it's, it's it's quite small. It's like a kid, it's like a child, and it has a child's voice. You know, some people say it sounds like a boy, some say it sounds like a girl, but you know, it's 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 a kid's voice. And so it's very non-threatening. And, you know, again, the way the face is, it's not really like a human face with skin, you know, it's it's this sort of plasticky thing with lights. So I think there's, there's a lot of research, you know, I think there's, this is where you have that multidisciplinary thing kicking in, where you have like psychologists, you know, working with designers, working with roboticists to try and see what the best solution is. But movies purposefully try to show you the uncanny valley because, you know, that's entertainment. Like Terminator franchise is so successful because it has that, in, especially in the first, you know, Terminator movie, that human face melting off and you've got the metal face inside. And, you know, that's not what, you know, that's not really what we're trying to design in the lab here but it, it's great for entertainment right but i think yeah i think going back to what we were talking about when you start to broaden that perspective of what a robot is you kind of realize you know they're everywhere and they don't have to look like us they're serving a specific purpose and when we have robots that sort of look humanoid there's a lot of tricks happening behind the scenes to make it look and behave like a person um even though it's you know it's not actually doing anything that sophisticated so part of the actual goal, like when you when they make the 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 idea of the humanoid uh, sort of robot is is more to do with the fact that it's more pointing on to it's to do with the fact that they're humanoid, not so much with any specific perp like use that they might have. So there's more. Yeah, I mean the only the only area that I'm like very familiar with is social robots, where you have right. robots that do look a little bit like 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 mm -hmm. with Pepper that I that you know you have in the poster. Then you know there's a few other robots as well. 
Uh, but generally, I think when you're designing a robot, like I said, it's very inefficient to design the human form because the way that our muscles work, it's completely different to how like electronics and motors work, you know. Um, and it's much easier to design, you know, like you see like those factory looking robots that are sort of picking things and placing things and, you know, all types of these different types of designs uh, that we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think the, I think it's interesting how, um, you know, we, we, met, we talked about the humanoid and then also, you know, AI and the fact that, yes, you're not looking at it, you're not looking at something that looks like us, but you're hearing something that replies, it's always sounding more yeah. like us. And it, it just kind of, I think it starts to open people's minds up to just the scope of possibility and just just what the, the, the it's endless what can you know what can be done or what could be done the potential yeah. what it can, it can be, be a little scary and intimidating exactly. and you know, it can be just, a bit intimidating and yeah. and oftentimes forgetting what came before we see what we the the, the techn technological advancements that there have been now and people people start to think okay well where does this go what is the end game like how far obviously these things are going to keep getting Technology is going to keep improving and it's going to keep affecting the way we live for better. Obviously, I mean, there's clear, you know, uh, uh, examples of how it does that. But is this also a threat, a threat to our jobs, the way we live, the way we conduct our lives, the way we we survive? And so in a way, the, the question of the debate of robots taking over jobs, is this really a question of machines taking over humans flat out like there's you know take yeah. one out, put another one in sort of thing yeah. a black, um, like a black mirror episode exactly <laughs> you know um, it more redundant or is it something yeah. more complex is it more how do we even know really but you know how is it really as black and white as a lot of people fear sometimes i think a lot of times it's just a sense of fear um, yeah, I, I, just to mention, I know that the comment that's come up, I think that's an interesting one. And I think, you know, just to save that for later, um, to hit on that, how AI is transforming, the, you know, the worlds of work, specifically education, yes. I think. And we're going um, but to yeah, just to answer your question about jobs and things, and I think that would might feed into this, is, you know, we, if you, if you trace back the human species, right, from the beginning, like from, I guess, from whenever you could start calling us homo sapiens, mm -hmm. The one constant that we've had is, is progress of technology, right? Starting from the fires and build, building better fires and, you know, better sort of villages and, and better tools and, and weapons and, you know, all types of things. And, you know, then we get to like electricity and the industrial revolution. So there's, there's been this constant drive towards progress. And even today, you know, every year there's like, there's a better phone, there's a better, you know, better piece of technology, there the are better cars we have this sort of innate drive for development, for, for innovation, for, you know, really going after the next challenge. And I think that's what really technology is. It's, it's very much just a part of us, an extension of us. And so far we've overall managed to use it to better the human species, right? The quality of life today is much better than it was, you know, maybe a thousand years ago. And you have to side where, yeah, there is, you know, technology that's helping that, but it's also, you know, our thoughts have evolved, uh, the way we think about things have evolved, you know, there were certain things that were legal or acceptable in the past, and now we realize that was really messed up, right? Mm -hmm. So as our thoughts evolve, and, you know, we pass down our thoughts and concepts and theories, and the later generations work on them, you know, technology, technology is a more physical form of that, it's, you know, we're developing these things, and they get passed down. So then you develop more things to tackle more challenges because that's what we want to do, right? Once you've conquered all the shores, we want to go to space, you know? Yeah. Um, and th that's really what we do. So I think there's always been a fear of technology, right? I, I think you know, when elect electricity, when I think there was Nikola Tesla, you know, there was this whole debate against, you know, alternating current and direct current and people were thinking that it's going to die in their homes because it is a terrifying concept having electricity running through your house, but we're just so used to it that we don't really think of it in those terms. We yeah. don't realize how terrifying it is. Um, and, you know, it's we've, we've found a way to do it safely. There's regulations in place, right? And most of us, you know, we, we have some sort of understanding of how sockets work, so we're not, you know, putting a finger inside it and so on. So we, we found a way to do it safely, and it's for the better. Now we have light and we have, you know, all these devices we can use, you know, the hospitals, all these uh, medical machine and equipment, they run on electricity. So 
I guess what I'm getting to in a long way is it's the same with robotics. It's developing, it's inevitable, it's happening. I think the question isn't whether it's good or bad because there's no point assigning sort of moral values to these concepts. It's about, it's happening. How can we use it to improve the human condition? How can we use it for the better of the human species? And, you know, I talk about how we have to strive, right, to face challenges, to go for the next big thing. And unfortunately, the truth of our society is that there's a large amount of people and, you know, there's the way that we're set up, there's, there's a lot of jobs. If you look at really the bottom barrel of jobs in terms of safety, right, mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, how satisfying or fulfilling it is, those are the type of jobs that robots are really good at because they're really good at repetitive routines and tasks and they can work in unsafe environments. So, you know, you think of like, for example, factory workers. So, okay, you know, it seems good. It seems, okay, we can have robots doing that so we don't need to put humans there. But then the problem becomes, what about the people who are being displaced? Right, what about the person who has been working in the factory for the past 10 years? That's the only thing they know in the past 20 years. And um, what do they do next? And I think that's where the conversation needs to be, mm -hmm. as you know, how can we develop solutions to help with that transition, right? Now, Andrew Yang, you might've heard of, he was running for the 2020 presidential race and he had this idea of the universal basic income. And uh, now I'm not saying that's the, the correct solution, but I think it's great that there are people trying to figure out how to deal with automation and realizing it's happening, but we need to make sure it happens for the better. You know, I myself imagine maybe some sort of, you know, transition period, maybe there's like a funded, you know, 12 month retraining program where, you, you know, people get retrained, their skills get retrained to apply mm -hmm. for something else. But, you know, I'm not an economist and, you know, there's arguments that, well, we're gonna run out of jobs, but there's new jobs coming. I mean, we the, t due to technology, Right. Being a YouTuber wasn't a thing 15 years ago. Yeah. Right. And I'm not saying it's a very stable career today, but the truth is there are people earning enough and more than enough, even though, you know, it's rare and it's difficult. It's easier if you just go a traditional career route. But the fact of the matter is we created technology, we created YouTube, and now there's like a whole nother platform, this podcasting, which wasn't really a thing before. You know, we only had radio shows. So technology is constantly creating new jobs and new work environments. But I think if we don't prepare now, it's gonna be a little bit like the pandemic, right? The pandemic forced us to adopt this remote working thing and adopt technology. If we had you know, prepared and learned how to use all this technology beforehand, that transition would have been smoother. It's the same with robotics and jobs, right? If we prepare now to transition people into new jobs and figuring, figuring out what, that, what the solutions could be, then when, you know, once this really happens in full force, which it will, you know, if a company saves money by having a robot in the factory, it will get a robot. Um, and, you know, we would be much, the transition would be much smoother. Otherwise, you know, this will happen and then people will be forced to adopt. And I think that's much more rougher because people won't be prepared for it and the governments won't be prepared for it. Mm -hmm. And just one last point to, you know, add to this is we need to realize this is not an isolated issue just in the field of robotics, right? Just like when the pandemic happened, the decisions that are made okay, you have the scientific advice, you have the medical advice, but you need to look at the, you know, the economics of it all. You need to think about mental health, like what is psychologically this doing to people, the decisions you make. It's the same here, right? It's not just about robots displacing jobs, but it's about when we transition these people, what are the economic factors playing into it? What are the psychological factors, you know, regarding the person's mental health who's being replaced by this? Because, you know, so there's all these things that need to be put in place. And I think this conversation needs to be much broader, which, with people from many more fields sort of chiming in and putting forward their point of view. And I think that's how we get progress. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, as you said, it's, and you touched upon so many of like the, the core issues and it just shows how broad this, this discussion really is because as you said, the technology in and of itself is neither good nor bad. It's sort of the way that it's applied and and the, within what infrastructure it's you know it's applied that that it can that it can either go one way or the other. I mean you know the economics of of it too are you know if you look at a business, it's obvious that you know if they can implement certain technology that could make their their they can make them more money or anyway make their business you know streamline it and make it more efficient. They're going to do that now. Is it going to be at the expense of you know certain jobs? Yes. Now, now what? There has to be, there has to be something there. How do we minimize that effect? Or how do we actually turn it into something positive, right? If you have someone who has yeah. been working, you know, say you're, a, I mean, I was looking at a list of like most dangerous jobs. And I don't know how accurate this list is because it was on the interwebs. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's it, lorry drivers were up there because, you know, mm -hmm. they're driving 
you know, they have night shifts, they're driving these, you know, long distances, they've got to deal with traffic, they've got to make sure they have enough sort of fuel consumption, you know, they've got to meet various criteria. And it's very unsafe, you know, that's where accidents can potentially happen. And now with the innovation of driverless cars, you know, very soon we could have driverless lorries, which sort of replace the human drivers. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it's good that human is not driving it, so they don't risk their life and they don't risk the other person's life. But then what is that person going to do next? And how can we transition it so whatever they're doing next is better because everything worse has been taken up by robotics. Um, so I think it's really just about looking at the positive side and you know how can we, and it's not just minimizing a damage, so to speak, it's to sort of using that potential to create something even more positive out of what was before. Uh, right. and having that transition. Yeah, I mean, it may, if anything, it makes us more capable. Um, and I understand, you know, the, the, the industrial revolution was a bit of a mess, right? I mean, now we have many more regulations and policies in place to try and have a better transition. Um, and I mean, that's what we should really be working towards anyway. And, but, you know, even going back to the washing machine, like before washing machines were a thing, I think it was called, had like washermen and washerwomen who would, you know, uh, uh, do laundry for you. And now that's not really a thing. Um, so yeah, there's you know there's constantly yeah technology is replacing certain jobs, but I think it's it tends to be replacing jobs that like what's the alternative right? Do we want every future generation to have people working in these inhumane factories and driving lorries and you know and all of this, or do we can we envision a future where robotics and automation has taken over a lot of these routine and repetitive tasks and all the humans are really working in this productive environment where they feel like they're contributing they're facing new challenges they get a sense of sort of fulfillment out of what they do I mean I feel fortunate enough to be working in an area where I feel very satisfied and fulfilled with the research I'm doing right I'm facing these challenges and I'm sort of constantly figuring out you know problem solving um, but a lot, a lot of people aren't and the way I'm seeing is I'm envisioning a future where you can sort of utilize more of your time in this more sort of creative and productive endeavors as opposed to just like a repetitive you know nine to five mm -hmm. tasks that you may be doing um and you know when it comes to you know how how much technology are we getting too reliant well yeah of course there's you know there's always the risk like this i'm trying to remember there was the airbus it was the new a380s or one of one of the new models yeah. uh, they had you know that new autopilot which which i think interfered with, with how the pilot wanted to pilot it and you know we had there was a plane crash and then all those planes all that specific models were grounded there was like a software was a update, the whole thing yeah. Yeah. oh it was boeing right yeah um so it's it's you know there's there's this constant thing like yeah you know we need to be careful with how this is implemented and specifically how ai is implemented and again, I'll go back to it. That's why this should not be, technology should not just be limited to the technologists or scientists. You need, you know, you need people from an ethics background. You need people from, you know, psychology background. There's this, in the Bristol Robotics Lab, you know, we have an autonomous, we had an autonomous car, you know, driving project. And I, if I remember correctly, uh, part of that project was to investigate like a, from a psychological aspect, you know, how much is the person trusting the car, right? They were doing these trials to see how quickly does the person take over the steering wheel if they're told to, and how reliant and how comfortable or how safe they feel when the car is just driving them around. Um, so I think it's very important to approach this sort of work from that angle so that we don't have a technology that we're over relying on because we do have a tendency when a company puts a product out we want to trust it a hundred percent we don't even read the instruction manuals right, right. we just kind of trust it's going to work because as they said it's not going to break so we need to be careful how we develop yeah. technology but i do think you know I, I think a lot of the research is very responsible and i just think it needs to be communicated that way perhaps to to the general public and, you know, yeah, when you have corporations developing products, you do question, you know, how much work have they put in because it's, it's for profit. Um, but that's why I think it's useful to have, you know, have more open standards of research and technological development, you know, open sourcing more things. So you can have some sort of cross collab collaboration. But I feel like that's a whole nother sort of mm. uh, Pandora's box to get into. <laughs> um, I mean, given given that we are going in that direction and uh, you know speaking as as you know this talk is made, is also you know supposed to be dealing with what we think you know the jobs of tomorrow are going to be based on this trend like 10 years from now or you know in 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 the not so distant future what do you think that the the workplace will look like from you know 
from how how we work within that workplace and the kinds of actual jobs that w works that are happening yeah. yeah i mean it's yeah it's fascinating to think about really i mean you know with again like with everything that's happened with the pandemic you know from a technical perspective my mind goes towards like virtual and augmented reality you know using that type of technology to have sort of more interactive meetings for people who are in different ge geographical locations and things like that, right, from from a technical standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of the actual jobs, I mean, your guess is as good as mine. Like I said, you know, being a YouTuber wasn't a thing like 10, 15 years ago. Um, and now there's so many young aspiring people on the internet trying to become YouTubers. And, you know, podcasting wasn't a thing. And it's, a, you know, it's a reasonable thing that people do. There's some really good podcasts out there. Uh, people from different fields and you know sometimes it's side income sometimes it's their main gig but you know I was listening I can't remember the person's name but they were talking about how they they think the future is going to be people sort of being employed by themselves so you have these sort of almost mini organizations and you sell your services to other people so you know you're really good at this or you're really good at that and then people just use apps you know like like with an uber you call a cab they use apps to just find someone to do something for them could be something like that. It could be something completely different. So, you know, the only the only thing I would say is my hope for the future is that people have more opportunities to follow and and really, yeah, really follow their passion and, and do things that they find fulfilling to the point where the financial incentive is almost secondary, that they enjoy what they're doing so much that generating money, you know, that's great so that, you know, they can pay their rent and all these things. But, you know, I really wish people could, you know, do things that they love because they can just be so much more productive in that type of environment. I guess with the lorry driving thing, I, I was, I'm was i really more sort of concerned and also talking about factory work as it's really the safety of it all, right? How secure and safe it is. Right. And I think obviously the step to having some sort of driverless solution isn't, I, I don't think it's immediately replacing drivers with driverless lorries, but it's more about you probably still have the driver in there um, because, you know, the vehicle isn't completely autonomous, but it has so many autonomous features that the driver doesn't have to do so much. So they're not mm -hmm. constantly under stress. And, you know, right. even like a simple thing as, you know, when we started having automatic vehicles and, you know, not having gears to constantly change, that made the lives much easier and mm -hmm. you could focus on the road a bit more. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's I think it's a slow proce process, but I think the, the at the end, if, if a self-driving lorry is more efficient and faster and safer, than a person doing it, a company is going to buy those, right? They're not gonna employ people. So my point is it's inevitable, right? right. What, what we need to think about is, okay, so what is it that the lorry drivers could transition to in, in this in this specific scenario? What is their skill set appropriate for? Or how they could, you know, they could maybe some with some retraining, perhaps uh, they could be, you know, reassessed and they could be transitioned into doing something different. Because I think if we don't do that, if you keep thinking, you know, it's in the future, it's just going to happen one day. And then you'll have a lot of people without jobs and the government without a solution mm -hmm. uh, to this type of problem. Right. Um, and I think that really is, you know, the gist of it. At the end of the day, this is happening. It's a reality. Right. We just need to figure out how to navigate this reality to figure out, you know, what it is that these people could do that they could find just as fulfilling or even perhaps even more fulfilling, right. uh, fulfilling to do. And I think we're inching closer, you know, with, with technolo technological advancements and with each generation, I think we are inching closer to that, also that concept of, you know, follow your passion. Like it's, you know, it's very difficult even in today's world, like you can't, you know, you can't just become an astronaut because you want to or become some sort of rock star if you want to, but we are getting closer to that type of world, right? Um, yeah. And you see that with YouTube, there's musicians out there, who, you know, who really started their career off YouTube. Um, yeah. I mean, an example would be Justin Bieber. I believe he used to make YouTube videos before he was discovered, right? Yeah. Um, but there's, you know, there's a lot of artists that, you know, start. So with technology is helping us get to that stage, um, as long as we, you know, we follow it in that way instead of trying to fight it. Or yeah, I think well, with the field of education itself, if you think about schools, you know, primary schools and so on, yeah. you know, the, my view on this and my perspective on this, and you know, I'm sure there's different views on it is, you know, in, in the nearer future, it's it's more of an integration of, you know, you still have the sort of the human, the teacher in the classroom, but there's a bit more assistance from sort of AI and, and you know, I mean, we already see it with, you know, the smart boards and things like that in the classroom, just to make this whole experience more interactive. Mm -hmm. I mean, there could be potentially when, you know, for, I know at the moment, a lot of teachers hate having to teach remotely. 
and it's part of that is a limitation of the technology. You know, there's only so much interaction you can have over a webcam. Um, but you know, with further advancements, like I mentioned, in augmented reality and all these things, maybe we would have classrooms that are spread across, you know, continents, and uh, but they're just as interactive. But I still see, you know, that like the person in the classroom an essential part of this. Now, I, I think there was some research specifically looking at I think children with learning disabilities. Mm -hmm. And it looks at because sometimes some some of the children they they relate less to a human teacher, but when it's sort of you know like a pepper sort of scenario, where it's something relatable or something something social like that, they tend to respond better to certain mm -hmm. things. I mean, there's research you can look up, and I'm I'm not right. citing any specific works, um, but there is research in that area which I think is quite interesting. So it's really about how you could utilize maybe some sort of technology to get them more familiar because you know you have all the shyness with interacting answering a teacher and, and talking to a person and sometimes with, with specific, specifically with children uh, when you have something like a robot that some of that shyness tends to go away and I've seen it because I've gone to events where I've taken Pepper with me and you know kids are not you know they are they'll be like touching it and tapping its head and I'd have to actually tell them to like step back you know, they're not intimidated by it at all. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, having something like Pepper, who is maybe educating parts of it, uh, would be an interesting concept. But again, like I say, you would still need that human supervision. You know, you still need, uh, the, you still need that human touch, you know, to really make a connection and understand what's happening. I think it's just about assisting it. And you, when you think about large classrooms where you have, uh, you know, I see this in India a lot specifically, where you have like a classroom full of like 50, 60 children and there's one teacher. And it's, you know, it works in a university, but when you have, you know, five or 10 year olds and 60 of them, it's, it's, it's chaotic, right? And it's very difficult to get everyone's attention. You know, you could potentially have some assistance from some sort of technology, some sort of interactive technology, like you see with Alexa and all of okay. these to just keep everyone in the classroom together and focused on the teacher. So I really see that type of like ecosystem of technology working with the person, you know, rather than technology replacing the person in this field. Because I think you need a person, you know, the people who are sort of in charge of that school, they're sort of maybe looking at saving some bucks. But, you know, I think I think essentially, you know, when, when anytime you're introducing things like tablets, uh, especially to the younger, you know, children, you have to be sort of careful about introducing technology because, you know, there's obviously is that addictive nature of, you know, using tablets for certain things and, you know, with the Internet and everything. Um, and I think there needs to be more careful consideration of how you approach it. And I think it is very important before you, you know, before you hand, especially from, a, from the perspective of the school, to really educate the children on the concept of internet. Like, what is the internet? You know, everyone's anonymous there. People can say anything, right? You don't believe stuff. Like, they, they really need to be educated to that level before they're sort of given, you know, untethered access to whatever they want to do, right? They need to be, they also need to be informed, you know, like the spending hours on a tablet screen or how that affects your eyes. You need to be blinking and taking constant breaks and posture and these things. And I think it's very important to feed all that information in before you just hand out technology to children for yeah, them well, to use. Yeah, I mean, on, on that note, I was I'm wondering, was it something that needs to be incorporated into an educational curriculum? Like the use of, I mean, the fact that we are more heavily rely, heavily relying on these things would you say that then that some aspect of that needs to be not just applied in yeah. the setting, but also like let's talk about this or like you know how yeah. how do, how can it be incorporated into the into the the yeah. actual teaching? Yeah, I mean, firstly, I'm not sure you know because I'm so so out, out of touch what the current curric curriculum is itself. <laughs> so maybe there are things in place that you know that, you know there's some sort of informative discussion about the internet and these things at a young age because it is very important to have at a young age because even if you don't hand the technology, they might get access to it <laughs> regardless. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely think yeah, you know, that needs to be a big part of you know how how you're using technology. You know, perhaps like a specific. It's a specific dedicated module based on technology on iPads, use of laptops, you know, um, because once a child gets access to it, you know, that's a lot of power. And I think they just need to be well informed, you know, like how you do at home before you allow your 
child to start plugging in appliances into the wall, you tell them like, you know, it's electricity, it's harmful. You know, when, when you hand a knife to a kid, you just, just don't hand a knife to a kid, right? You teach them how to properly chop so they don't, you know, they don't cut their finger and you tell them in the event of cutting a finger what to do. Um, so I think we might be handing out technology a little too easily. So I think maybe some sort of curriculum, like you said, needs to be put in place that, you know, it, it goes over these safeguards, like informing the children certain things that they need to be informed about uh, before they're handed that technology, treating it, you know, like a knife or like, you know, like a power socket or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess, yeah, a bit more focus on that. I mean, the thing is like, even today, like even adults, and I mean, I, a lot of people I feel like don't really understand this concept that when, when you have the internet and when everyone is anonymous, right, on something like Twitter, people can really say anything. And you don't you don't need to believe it, but you don't even have to fight over it, right? Because, right. you know, you see, I, 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 I know people who go over, you know, online arguments and things. And I mean, you see a lot, you know, when the elections happen and, and stuff like that, you know. Um, and I think there's this sort of misconception about, because when you see someone face to face, you're more careful about what you say. You're not just going to start arguing with the person and you're more likely to maybe agree or agree on similar grounds, you know, like agree to disagree, but I see your point of view. But when you read something online, you just want to attack them. Um, and I think, again, it's, it's, I feel like maybe the newer generation is adopting better, um, but we need to, you know, try and really make sure that, you know, people are aware of that, especially children, because um, yeah. it can affect their mental health and their mental development, definitely. I think, um, well, firstly, I just want to clarify, because I see some, some of the comments, uh, you know, saying Dr. Prankit, I'm not doctor yet, um, <laughs> but maybe in a couple of months, I'm nearing. <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, um, but yeah, to answer your question, I think, so when I was talking about, you know, children in schools, I'm like, you definitely need that human element, right? Now, if you think about like higher education and, and, and you know, universities and things, I think, that's where it maybe gets a little bit more complicated just because a lot of us are just pretty good at learning from reading or learning from like watching a video you don't need the person to be there now obviously the person the professor being there it can help you answer the questions and you know clear your doubts and things like that um but i think that is a potential area where you would have maybe a bit more of technology assisting uh, a student just because again no if you go into like I think typically with like engineering classes, they can get really big at universities, right? And you have like one professor all the way at the, you know, you can barely see them if you're sitting all the way at the back. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. So I, yeah, I think those are the type of areas where you could see a bit more sort of AI and technology being used, but you definitely still need a human element, right? Who's setting the curriculum, right? Who's, who's marking it? I don't think AI marking your paper is the best answer unless it's like multiple choice or something. Um, just because it's so subjective, right? Like if you're told to answer a question, there's, there could be different elements in there that, you know, um, uh, help you. So I think, you know, you still have that human element there, but I think that's where technology can take over a little bit. And I also feel that everyone, and I guess, you know, I'm biased because I am from the technical field, but I do think, you know, children and, and even, you know, people at university, I think everyone should have some sort of understanding of you know how we discuss like how what is computer programming or you know what is ai like because otherwise it appears like magic and i think that's bad because if you don't understand like if you don't really know you know you've got an alexa and you're talking to it sorry if i triggered anyone's uh, amazon echo there <laughs> uh, but if you've got a device and you're talking to it uh, and it's responding back you know i think it, it, this type of technology can be very misleading uh, and, you know, talking about, you know, job displacements, again, like with telemarketers and stuff, I think that's another area where AI is sort of taking over, where it can sort of have a conversation. We see that with the with the Google project. Um, so, yeah, I think that's where, uh, you know, I think having some awareness of how these systems work, you know, nothing too technical, just like a overview of how these things work. I think that, I think that would help us navigate today's, like this modern world, uh, uh, much better because people won't have those misconceptions and you know they'll be aware about the real issue it's like the real issue with something like the amazon echo is privacy right it's not really that your amazon echo would become self-aware or something but yeah. you could make a good argument about privacy and you know how much is it recording so there are some real concerns there but i think sometimes people don't really know what to be worried about because technology is just so new <laughs> and i think that's why it's very important that you know you're careful what you put out there um, and you're careful what you put on the internet <laughs> and 
especially you know if if you're you know if you're publicly putting information out there that's a you know, whole nother thing like be careful it can come back to bite you 10 years later because <laughs> yeah. um, you know jokes don't translate and, and you know all these things but also just like private information anything you're putting online you need to have i think you know it's it's people need to have that awareness so that it's 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 only safe to a certain limit right and anything is like if you have a photograph at home where someone could break into your house and steal that photograph essentially um, but anytime you're using technology for convenience, you are giving up some of that privacy. And, you know, with, uh, it's a bit of a problem with companies as well. Again, I think being open and, and about what their security protocols are, because, you know, we don't really know how sometimes how secure certain things are. And they've been data breaches, you know, hacks in the past. I think, yeah, there needs to be this understanding that you need to be very careful about what you are putting. It's, it's a, that's a real concern, basically. And my yeah. point is, look, don't, don't put anything online you're not comfortable with, right? Now, when you're having online classes and things, you're not really putting anything out there that could harm you, right? Or when you're using it like that. But if you're having a confidential work meeting, there needs to be that sort of awareness that you're using a secure app, you're using a secure channel, um, and, you know, you need to have certain safeguards in place. And, you know, universities and you know, people have IT departments and, you know, they have their sort of technical department to make sure that is the case, that everything is sort of protected and, and encrypted. But I think a lot of times the users don't understand what is protected and what's not, you know? If you have a laptop or a computer given to you by a company, most likely that's encrypted by the company. So it's generally a good idea not to transfer data from that to your personal computer, because that's not encrypted, for example. Right. Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, yeah, I think, you know, I think there's definitely, so let's start from the diagnosis end, right? I think there's definitely a lot of work done with AI for diagnosing things. I mean, just starting with COVID, you know, there was, I was reading this paper a few days ago and there was research on, uh, you know, so it basically utilizes the sound of your cough to then diagnose whether you have COVID or not. Yeah, um, and then there was things, you know, and then there's things about, you know, using x-rays to try and sort of diagnose quickly, you know, whether you have COVID or not. So th there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, work being done in terms of diagnosis. Now, for people who are already managing a condition, I think, again, that's where, you know, we have technology, you know, we have like Fitbits and wearables you can wear that can sort of monitor uh, uh, your vitals. And there's also a lot of AI working there in the background to try and, you know, monitor how certain levels are, you know, uh, metabolic sort of uh, rates are sort of uh, increasing and decreasing. And yeah, I definitely think that, you know, as we develop this field, um, there, there are going to be many more solutions to help people manage their uh, conditions in a more responsive manner, as well as, you know, having, and it sort of relates back to what I was doing, what I'm doing with that, my research, where you yeah. have that care worker who is sort of involved. In here, you'd imagine, you know, you'd have the NHS database, which is sort of part of this ecosystem, and you'd have alerts, you know, if, if there's something potentially, you know, there's a health risk taking place. You know, I mean, there's been instances when people got, you know, diagnosed certain conditions because of the uh, Apple Watch and, and so on early on, um, um, and, you know, heart palpitations and those type of things. So it's already, you know, happening. Yeah, no, I think, yeah, I think... Um, when it, when it comes to AI, uh, I think there's definitely, like I say, I'm not in touch with uh, uh, curriculums in schools right now, but just having the knowledge that I do with AI and, you know, other people, there's, there's definitely, you can think of building, you know, very easy to use tools for people who are not familiar with AI or even just, you know, the younger generation in general to familiarize themselves with, you know, how these things work without having to essentially learn programming, you know? Uh, right. Without having to know how to code, you could sort of play around with things. And, and I think there's some some tools already out there that allow you to uh, uh, do this to a certain degree. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I definitely think there needs to be sort of, you know, more tools in like, like it mentioned, like simulators uh, to help help people learn and do AI without programming. I mean, programming is one of those things I feel like with AI, even programming is going to reduce a lot because I can I can already imagine you know maybe 10 15 years down the down the line where you you you'd be able to sort of inform your intent to a software and it would then essentially write the code for you and it's already there with you know I don't know if you've ever used like a website tool to make websites but there's like Wix and a lot of these yeah there's all these tools out there where you don't necessarily need to know coding right you just kind of drag and drop and yeah. stuff and it does the coding behind the scenes so I think this is like essentially the same idea, but relating more towards like artificial intelligence or like machine learning uh, specifically, you know. Right.
Interesting. This is a fantastic question. So, uh, and no, yeah, very really good question. So any sort of AI that you have, right, it's only as good as the data it's been trained on. Mm. Now, an easy way to imagine that is, you know, the text prediction on your phone, it sees how you type and it starts predicting stuff based on what you're typing. Now, if you keep typing gibberish, it's not really going to have good predictions. Right. But if you give it good data, if you're, you know, typing coherently um, before you have your drinks, uh, it would have more, you know, it would have it would have more appropriate, you know, predictions. And now what happens with AI, sometimes you can get biases involved. Um, and, you know, there, there was this famous case where an AI was trained on like lawsuits and and uh, and, and then it was it was told to then sort of, you know, just to, it, I think it, it wasn't like anything, I don't think they were like officially using it. It was just an interesting experiment. Now the problem was there were, there's been so much bias in previous convictions especially in the US, that yeah. that bias enters the AI. So you have to be very careful how that AI is trained. Like this, this whole field of, you know, using good data. Um, and again, you know, it's one of those things that like, I don't think it's a very difficult concept to grasp, but people don't really know about this type of stuff, you know, and I think this is the sort of stuff that you can introduce to people without them having to necessarily understand the core of how machine learning is working, right? It's yeah. very, and there was, there was another experiment, it was a Twitter bot, uh, a company created that became increasingly racist. And the reason it became racist is because, you know, people as a joke, I suppose, you know, they were tweeting inappropriate things at the bot and it was learning from the tweets. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, you need to have that understanding of whenever you're building an AI, the data you use to train it is maybe even more important than the AI model itself. And it's like us humans, right? If you're, if you're raised up in a very biased uh, environment, Right. You tend to be a little biased when you grow up. Right. It's in the past. Right. I mean, you look at, you know, before like the feminist movement and stuff like people genuinely believed biases because they were brought up in that environment. Right. Mm -hmm. So an AI is not that different. Like if you're giving it bad data, it's going to give you a bad output. We need to be careful about the data we give it. And that's what I really love about this. Like when you ever take a field and you bring it back to like the human <laughs> condition, you know, like relate it back. I think that's when it makes it really interesting. But well, we that's how, you know, working with AI, it kind yeah. of helps us understand how we learn things and, you know, react to things. Right. Be a catalyst also I mean, for that kind of problem. Yeah, we, we pass on our flaws, right, <laughs> to whatever yeah. we're creating, right? Um, yeah, yeah. So I, I think we just need to be careful of that. And to be, I mean, to be completely honest, you know, like the, ex like the experiment I mentioned with the lawsuits and stuff, it's that's the reason these experiments are done to show that, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, generally researchers are very aware that you can very, I mean, it's one of the first things you learn when you're learning AI and machine learning is having good data. So, you know, it's not like this problem is some, some, some it's a new concept. It's something that, you know, they're very aware, um, but it helps, you know, if, if more people are sort of informed about this type of thing. Um, and, you know, you can have lots of examples, like, you know, you have the Nest Learning thermostat, which is a thermostat that automatically adjusts your temperature based on your usage. But right. if you're just randomly using it, it's going to do random stuff. It's not yeah. going to, you know, learn your routine. So it's any, anything is just as good as the sort of data you give it. Yeah, I think it's interesting that you mentioned law, though, because that, that, I think that's something that's so fundamentally down to human humans and the, the, the I mean, if you were to put AI as a judge, or you know, as a lawyer, it, you know, it, it, that's one of those things you think, wow, okay, how yeah. how would that go? Because that's something that's so incredibly. Yeah, no, I I think it's always more interesting to think in the terms of if you have the judge, but you also have an AI that can maybe point out certain aspects of the case that you didn't think about. Because an AI, like the way that usually it's trained on all the day, it's it's like trained, it's like a hundred judges together, right? If it's trained on cases from a hundred different judges. So if you have a human judge and then if, or, you know, I guess, depending what country you're in, what sort of law system you're following, but like you have some sort of AI assistance in place, so you're not missing anything out. I think that's a more useful scenario of utilizing yeah. AI rather than, well, you know, replacing the human completely. Because yeah. like I said, th these are the type of sort of jobs you could say or careers where humans are really needed, right? Because your input is so very valuable. Right, as opposed to, you know, and, and I think AI can be useful, but it can't replace, you know, at least not in the future that we're thinking about, really? right? Once we have this automation, maybe that's what we'll worry about. But, you know, this is what we're worrying about at the moment. Right now, that's the, that's the. Yeah. Um, so one of our final questions is from Telash asking, do you think in another 20 years, every household will have a robot? 
I mean, if you, going back to our conversation, if you think a washing machine is a robot, what we already do. But thinking about like the tradition, I think I know what, what they mean. It's, like, it's they're talking about like a humanoid robot assisting. Like I say, I don't know if it'll be humanoid, but you'll definitely have more technology that does the same thing, right? You can have a hob that turns off by itself. You don't need a robot to turn it on and off. It's sort of built into, you could, it could be built into your home. Like if you were to go 50 years back and ask someone, what would a car look like that a robot drives? They'd say, you know, there's a robot sort of sitting there holding the steering wheel and changing the gears. But there is no driver in a driverless car. It's called a driverless car. The car is the robot. So I think that in terms of, you know, I don't think you will necessarily see humanoid robots unless it's the social robots that I was talking about in certain circumstances. Um, I think it's going to be more about how that technology is built into the house itself. Um, a little bit like it's starting to become with things like Alexa and Google. Yeah, exactly right. It's sort of, yeah, you have this device that you can talk to. It's not like a robot moving around that you're actually speaking to constantly. Um, it's fun. the same thing. Yeah, I mean, any use case that you can think, like if you want a robot to do a certain task, uh, you can generally have something built into the house. You know, just a side note, you know, in terms of carrying things, there's this very cool project, again, in the, in the, in the assisted living. Uh, department that again you could see on the website where you have this sort of robot that is built into the infrastructure of the house and it sort of moves around the ceiling um mm -hmm. uh, the rails and it can sort of you know lift up trays and things and the reason it moves along the ceiling is because our uh, space is so cluttered you can't really have a robot move around unless it has two legs because our place is built for two legs um and it's much easier having a robot just move around the ceiling and lift things up and drop them so my point is it's not how you're envisioning it but there will be more technology in your home that does the same thing that you imagine a humanoid robot would be doing and perhaps right. it'll do it yeah so not quite like you see in in, in movies um, yeah exactly you know the entertainment that's what i'm saying like movies are great entertainment and you know it's a great way for you to expand your mind and think what's possible um, but at the same time, you need to realize that a lot of stuff shown in movies is because it looks cool. I mean, a robot on the wall just moving around doesn't look as cool as like a robot walking around. Like in the movie I, Robot, with, you know, I think it was Will Smith, or, um, uh, you know, a robot walking around your house and doing things, right? There was like a robot servant sort of scenario there. That looks cooler than like having yeah. a hob just turn off. Or, you know, like I say, like a washing machine is not very glamorous, is it? Um, but it's sort of doing that task of washing your clothes automatically. So, yeah. well, <laughs> as I said, we're, we're kind of we're we're already going in, in you know in that direction. Um, our very final question, because now we're already past our hour, Perfect. is from uh, DJ Chet. What are your views on the myths of about the risk of the superhuman artificial intelligence? Another really good, a really good question to end on. So, you know, a lot of people more qualified than me have spoken about this. You know, Elon Musk is one of the sort of the bigger voices out there. Um, and I think the point of it's the point here is not that at least, you know, that, oh, tomorrow there's going to be an AI that sort of takes over like those movies, right? I think the point here is we need to be careful how AI is implemented, right? Um, and when, when, we, I think at the moment, like I say, we don't really understand what like consciousness really is or what it really is to be self-aware. You know, we don't really, un like we have this whole psychological gap to fill to understand that before we can have an AI, I think that's able to do that. Because essentially a superhuman AI is like super intelligent AI generally seen as like self-aware and conscious and, you know, has feelings essentially. Um, but I think we're really far away from that. But I think the more immediate threat is about how we're utilizing AI, like militarization of AI, right? Mm -hmm. Using AI in drones to automatically find targets. What if the data you treated it is so bad that, you know, it <laughs> identifies friendly as, tar as targets or civilians and starts attacking them, right? Because again, it's as good as the data. So I think those are the areas. Anytime you have a life and death scenario, you need to sort of be careful about how you're implementing the AI, which is why the driverless car stuff, it take, it's taking a while, right? Because you need to get the thing working better than a human before you can say, you know, use it. Um, right. And, you know, I think that's where we need to be careful. I don't think, I personally, you know, being in this field, I don't think there's any sort of immediate risk of some sort of AI overlord. Um, you know, <laughs> I mean, if there's one thing from our conversation about, you know, about the jobs and, and automation sort of replacing jobs is, you know, I, I'd say, look, we need to prepare for that now because it's happening. I can't remember who said this, but it was such a good quote that like failing to prepare is preparing to fail. And I think that's essentially the, the direction we're headed right now, unless 
there's active conversations in you know various fields about how we can utilize this sort of automation for the benefit of all of sort of mankind. Frankie, thank you so much for a wonderful conversation. And thank you to everyone who watched and for all your questions and comments. Um, I hopefully, you know, in some time down uh, in, in the future, we will have a chance to chat again and, and also talk about. Mm. Talk then people can actually say doctor in the comments. And yes, exactly. It'll be accurate, yeah. <laughs> and we will be able to say doctor and talk more about uh, and the work specifically that Perfect. you have the assisted living. All right, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you very for much. having me. Thank you, and to everyone, have a lovely evening.